good morning everyone i am dr arsna and i am here to discuss harrison principle of internal medicine and i will be giving concise summaries of every chapter that is there in harrison and we are going to start with part number 7 that is respiratory system and the disorders uh, that are presented with it and the first chapter in that is the approach to any patient who presents to us with respiratory disease this chapter is basically centered around how we approach the history the physical examination of a patient who comes to us with complaints uh, that are suggestive of a disorder uh, in the respiratory system so uh, before we understand uh, these disorders so you should know uh, about the classification of diseases that occurs in respiratory uh, medicine so the various uh, respiratory disorders in medicine they are grouped under uh, obstructive restrictive or vascular disease category uh, restrictive disorders are again classified into two major categories either it is a parenchymal disorder or an extra parenchymal disorder extra parenchymal disorders are further subdivided into either a neuromuscular type of illness or a chest wall and pleural illness so uh, these are the basic categories of diseases that you should know in respiratory medicine apart from these there are two other categories first is the various infectious diseases that might happen of which the most important that we need to study is pneumonia and uh, then we have neoplastic diseases uh, which can be either primary or metastatic primary disease is referred to as bronchogenic carcinoma uh, which is divided into two main categories either it is a small cell lung carcinoma or non small cell lung carcinoma non small cell lung carcinoma is then further subdivided it is categorized as uh, the large cell carcinoma the squamous cell carcinoma and the adeno carcinoma Uh, all of this information it is presented in the form of a table from Harrison. This is the first table in this chapter. So, in the obstructive pathophysiology, you will see that there is there are four important diseases. First is asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease along with bronchiectasis and chronic bronchitis. Okay, this disorder is chronic bronchitis. Then we have restrictive disease as I just described. That restrictive diseases are of two types. One is the parenchymal. The other one is uh, the extra parenchymal. The extra parenchymal diseases uh, encompass the neuromuscular type of illnesses or the chest wall and pleural illness. These are extra parenchymal illnesses. So in uh, the parenchymal type of disorder, generally we include various types of interstitial lung diseases and the various causes of it uh, together. Whereas in uh, the extra parenchymal disease, neuromuscular variety, you will include amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, Guillain-Barré syndrome, and myasthenia gravis. In chest wall and pleural disease illness, you can include the most important disorders, which are uh, kyphoscoliosis and the pleural effusions. These are the most important disorders to remember in uh, this particular. chapter then in pulmonary diseases the vascular diseases you should remember two important disorders first is the pulmonary embolism and the second one is pulmonary arterial hypertension these are the two most important uh, diseases to remember after that the malignancy as i already described the most important uh, ones are bronchogenic carcinoma and uh, then infectious disease mainly sh you should remember pneumonia now we, before we start into uh, the detailed discussion of uh, this chapter you should know some important definitions uh, that are uh, uh, that are used to label these various disorders so when i say that a person has an obstructive pathophysiology for a disease then the feb1 by fec ratio is uh, less than 0.7 then if the patient is uh, diagnosed to be having a respiratory type of uh, restrictive type of pathophysiology uh, the tlc has to be less than 80% of the patient predicted value uh, cyanosis is defined as a bluish discoloration of the skin and the mucous membranes which is due to an elevated um, amount of deoxygenated hemoglobin and the value is important it is greater than 4 g per deciliter and it can be also detected on pulse oximetry generally when the value uh, of uh, blood oxygen the sao2 it falls to less than 85% then the uh, the fingertips will start becoming blue then chronic cough is defined as cough that is lasting for more than 8 weeks duration and finally pulses paradoxus uh, which is defined as the uh, difference in the systolic blood pressure between uh, between expiration and inspiration which is greater than 10 mmhg you should remember that systolic blood pressure it increases during expiration and systolic blood pressure it generally decreases during inspiration but the inspiratory fall in uh, the uh, systolic blood pressure is constrained it is not that much but uh, when i say that the person is suffering from pulses paradoxus then this fall in the ins uh, inspiratory blood pressure okay this is more than 10 mmhg now uh, in any patient 
uh, in case of medicine, the general evaluation strategy of any patient who comes to us follows a defined sequence. That defined sequence is basically uh, that the patient undergoes a history and a detailed physical evaluation. But on that, now on the basis of this history and physical examination, you will, uh, in the clinician minds, a differential diagnosis will form. Okay. So after that, the pa the particular clinician will likely test this differential diagnosis with the help of various investigation. This includes uh, various uh, laboratory studies, various imaging studies that can be there or he may also perform various types of procedures. Using all these uh, additional uh, tools, he will approach and make a final diagnosis. And finally, when the patient, after diagnosis, the patient is treated. This is the general protocol. And the first component in any patient evaluation is always history. So history has some basic components. And these components are also the same when you are taking a patient who is suspected to be having a respiratory disease. So uh, you should uh, focus on what are the presenting problems, what is the history of the presenting illness, what is the past history that the patient is giving you, and also the personal social history components are important in case of pulmonary diseases. Which specific components are of primary importance, you should look for travel history uh, because travel history is associated with uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis exposure and it can lead to tuberculosis in a, suspect, a susceptible individual. Smoking uh, is a very important recreational uh, exposure and uh, uh, it uh, predisposes to a variety of respiratory diseases. You should remember uh, five important diseases uh, in respiratory medicine that are linked with smoking. This includes various asthma exacerbations, it includes emphysema, it includes interstitial uh, idiopathic interstitial pneumonia it is of two types okay the two specific varieties of uh, uh, idiopathic interstitial pneumonias are linked with uh, smoking these are referred to as smoking related ILDs and these ILDs are grouped under part of in idiopathic interstitial pneumonia this includes respiratory bronchiolitis associated interstitial lung disease and discomative interstitial pneumonitis okay so I will write the term this is respiratory bronchiolitis associated ILD and this is discoimative. Uh, similarly, uh, pulmonary Langerhans cell histiocytosis uh, and bronchogenic carcinoma which includes uh, squamous cell lung carcinoma and uh, the small cell lung carcinoma. These are the two disorders in car cancers which are very strongly associated with smoking exposure. So these are the various groups of respiratory diseases that can be linked to uh, smoking exposure. Apart from this, uh, any symptom in the patient, any symptom in the patient undergoes thorough evaluation under the principles of APQRST or PQRSTA, whatever you want to call it. This APQRST stands for associated symptoms that the patient might be having with that symptom. Along with that, what are the provocative and palliative features of that symptom? So what aggravates it, what will uh, reduce the severity of that disease, the quality, then R for radiation. S for the severity and the site of that particular lesion. So severity basically has to be assessed by the functional limitation that is imposed by that particular symptom. So say for example, the patient was uh, initially able to uh, jog 100 meters, now he is able to do only 50 meters. So the effect on the functional status of the patient is uh, the true assessment of the severity of the disease. And apart from that, you should note the timing. Okay, in timing, there are five key components that you should stress on. First is what is the onset of that disease, then what is the duration, the sequence in which that disease has evolved, uh, any progression that has occurred for that particular disease and what is the frequency of these symptoms. Okay, So these are the various things that you should keep in mind when you are noting the timing of that particular symptom. Now the cardinal symptoms of any uh, pulmonary disease, they are cough and dyspnea. Okay, This cough can be acute or it can be chronic. When I say acute cough and dyspnea, Okay, if specifically if it's associated with fever, you should always think of infection and it can be upper respiratory tract infection like sinusitis, but it can also be a more serious disorder uh, which is LRTI like pneumonia. Uh, when I say that this cuff is chronic, so it is meaning that it is lasting that uh, lasting more than eight weeks, uh, then any type of pulmonary disease uh, can, be, uh, can be the cause. So it can be obstructive, it can be restrictive, it can be any category of disease. So chronic cough and dyspnea requires detailed evaluation. Uh, similarly, acute dyspnea, acute dyspnea uh, has some very important specific differential diagnosis that you should keep in mind. This includes laryngeal edema which can be due to inhalational injury uh, that is seen in burn patients. Uh, then asthma and COPD exacerbations, pneumonia, uh, pul pneumothorax, pulmonary embolism and acute uh, left ventricle failure okay that causes back pressure into the uh, pulmonary circulation and uh, 
that will give rise to a feeling of uh, air hunger or suffocation this is the description that is given by the patient dyspnea is equal to shortness of breath okay and this is experienced either as a chest tightness or the inability to take a deep breath okay when this occurs you should suspect an asthma copd exacerbation but if the patient specifically says that mujhe aisa lag raha hai ki mujhe saans nahi aa rahi hai he is having a suffocating or smothering type of uh, clinical uh, description then you should think that it is generated due to heart failure now after this discussion we will move on to physical examination so physical examination again the general a sequence is always followed so you will always go with the general survey of the patient followed by that you will go with the systemic examination so the general survey will include components of uh, gen general appearance you will note the vital signs and the paleorectal cyanosis plumbing lymphadenopathy and edema will be subsequently noted and on systemic examination in respiratory system it follows a specific order it uh, includes inspection palpation percussion and then auscultation there is a predefined sequence of uh, various things that you will look for in in, in the inspection in palpation in percussion and auscultation the most important part of the examination in respiratory diseases is that of percussion and that of auscultation some portion of inspection with respect to uh, looking for an evidence of respiratory distress is very very important okay so if the patient is an obvious respiratory distress that is he is using his accessory muscles or there is a definite cyanosis uh, the respiratory rate is highly increased uh, the work of breathing is increasing the patient is decompensating then obviously expedited management is necessary um, in auscultation the uh, there are three categories of breath sounds that you should look for you should look for listen for the uh, important breath sounds like bronchial breath sounds vesicular and tracheal but you should always uh, look for the adventitious breath sounds that might be present that includes crepitations or crackles also referred to as rails then wheezes and bronchi then pleural friction rubs Uh, subsequently we have a category of transmitted breath sounds that this includes egophony bronchophony and whispered pectoriloquy so egophony is basically the conversion of e to a sound uh, on auscultation uh, bronchophony is the conversion bronchophony is the clear um, uh, clear auscultation of sounds like 99 99 Uh, generally these should be heard as muffled sounds but if they are very very clear then it is referred to as bronchophony and this whispered pectoriloquy is where when the patient whispers these uh, words like one 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 or uh, 99 99 only in a whispered tone then also it is audible at the back the clinical importance of uh, these important clinical features like egophony bronchophony whispered pectoriloquy along with that uh, a percussion note which is dull and tactile frameters okay all these things considered together uh, once i'll write it down if on inspection the mediastinum it looks normal on palpation tactile frameters is increased if on auscultation you hear bronchial breath sounds along with that you hear some crepts and along with that egophony bronchophony and whispered pectoriloquy are also positive then it uh, signals towards the lung pathology called as consolidation which can be seen in pulmonary edema it can be seen in pneumonia this is the basic importance of uh, these important clinical features then uh, you should know the importance of an absent chest uh, absent breath sounds these are referred to as silent chest so in silent chest uh, there are four important leads to consider first is uh, the pneumothorax then is pleural effusion then emphysema and any impending respiratory failure and asthma exacerbation it should be considered in concert with uh, presence of pulsus paradoxus in this patient along with a normal to increasing value of psu2 asthma patient normally will hyperventilate and this will lead to fall in the psu2 concentration but if this value it comes back to normal or is also increased from its normal value you should consider that the patient is under uh, is going into respiratory failure after that diagnostic evaluation will follow so history and physical examination will give a basic idea to the clinician of how this disease is uh, how what pattern of disease is he will likely uh, want to test it with the help of some laboratory evaluation that can include some laboratory studies some imaging in, in, in for important imaging and various types of procedures and in the laboratory studies the important uh, the important uh, 
uh, investigation is a spirometry that is a uh, type of pulmonary function test but uh, it will also include dlco and various lung volume measurements um, and uh, the looking at the flow volume loops similarly in the imaging studies uh, the important investigation is cxr uh, which is uh, taken in the poster anterior spa view and uh, the <coughs> procedure that is important is bronchoscopy so bronchoscopy can provide a non surgical lung biopsy specimen along with that you can go with the, uh, obtaining the alveolar sample with the help of bronchoalveolar lavage this is the basic description now uh, uh, there are two important things that uh, i will give extra and this includes the, the approach to hypoxemia uh, you should know what are the causes of hypoxemia and second thing is spirometry uh, and the pulmonary function testing how to uh, approach a particular disease on the basis of the results of pulmonary function testing so first is hypoxemia evaluation in hypoxemia uh, you should consider the alveolar to arterial gradient that is aag no this is the normal alveoli uh, when you inspire air this alveoli receives some oxygen this is referred to as arterial alveolar oxygen this then diffuses through the respiratory membrane and enters inside the blood it will then bind to hemoglobin and become part of arterial oxygen concentration uh, so because air is moving and diffusing inwards there is normally a gradient that exists between this uh, alveoli to uh, the arterial uh, arterial blood vessel this is referred to as aag that is alveolar to arterial gradient uh, the difference between these two values uh, can help us uh, classify hypoxemia into two basic types where the alveolar to arterial gradient is decreased and where the alveolar to, i'm sorry is decreased or you can say normal and where the alveolar to arterial uh, gradient is likely increased okay this is these are the two most important uh, differentials that you should keep in mind the uh, because this is very important now if this alveolar to arterial gradient if this is having a normal value then it means that the alveoli itself was not getting enough oxygen so you should consider uh, disorders like a decrease in fraction of inspired oxygen that can occur at mountains at high altitudes or you can consider hypoventilation that can be due to neuromuscular paralysis then increase in the alveolar to arterial gradient uh, it is seen when the alveoli are filled with oxygen but due to some pathology the oxygen is not transferring into the arterial uh, blood vessel so you should consider a vq mismatch you should consider uh, shunts that might be present and you should also look for uh, impaired diffusion that might occur uh, say for example due to interstitial lung disease so there are five important causes of uh, hypoxemia and this is the general classification of hypoxemia after that uh, the next discussion is related to spirometry evaluation in spirometry uh, you will get fev1 and fvc values that is the force expiratory volume in the first second and force vital capacity uh, but you have to supplement this with various lung volume measurements because these lung volumes they are not directly obtained by spirometry this includes tlc and residual volume and lastly you will look for dlco okay with the help of these uh, basic investigations you will be able to formulate a diagnosis you will uh, be, you will be able to reach a specific diagnosis in a patient so if i say that the fev1 is substantially decreased and so is fvc uh, the tlc is increased and so is the residual volume this is the general pattern that is manifested this is manifested by obstructive disorders okay this is the, the obstructive disease should be considered in a patient who manifests this type of pattern but uh, the dlc is a guide to which type of obstructive disease the patient has so if the patient has an increased dlc you should think of asthma if the patient has a decreased dlc you should think of emphysema and if the dlco is normal you should think of chronic bronchitis or you should think of bronchiectasis then similarly if i say that the fev1 is decreased but so is fe fvc in the uh, proportionate ratio uh, and the tlc is a decreasing okay and, and the tlc is decreasing this pattern is suggestive of this pattern is suggestive of a restrictive disorder this pattern suggestive of a restrictive disorder and the residual volume and the dlco will be the guide to uh, what type of disorder this restrictive disorders are of two types either they are parenchymal or they are extra parenchymal if i say that the residual volume is decreasing and so is the dlco whereas if the residual volume is normal and the dlco is also normal 
uh, the disorders can be differentiated. So in the first category, it is restrictive but parenchymal type of disorder, whereas um, the, in the other scenario, it is restrictive but extra parenchymal type of disorder. And lastly, uh, we are having pulmonary vascular diseases. If all of the pulmonary function testing is normal except for DLCO, which is decreased, you should think of a pulmonary vascular disease. This is the basic theory of uh, the approach to the patient with uh, pulmonary disease. I think this section will conclude here. There is one extra point uh, that I have added in these notes uh, that is related to flow volume loops. So flow volume loop is uh, generally having two components. One is related to inspiration and the other is related to expiration. And uh, this is related, th the flow is measured over here, the volume is measured over here. So you will be having this curve over here that is inspiratory curve and over here we have the expiratory curve. If the inspiratory curve undergoes plateau okay it, it, that and uh, if that particular curve has a plateau you should think of uh, the extra thoracic obstructions whereas if the expiratory curve the expiratory portion of the curve that undergoes a plateau you should think of intrathoracic variety of obstruction this is the basic concept this is the basic idea uh, i hope you will read the book and uh, thank you